paper on this panel will be presented by David Vanderham, coming from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, who will be presenting Virtuosity, Ravi Shankar, and the Valuation of Skill. So, welcome, Professor Vanderham. In his co-authored 1964 booklet, Music Memory, Pandit Ravi Shankar asks, why is virtuosity or speed so admired by the lay listener? The question, of course, is loaded. Already equating virtuosity with speed and assuming its easy appeal, Shankar goes on to explain that, quote, the general public has not received an extensive education in Hindustani classical music and therefore cannot be expected to immediately understand all the nuances of the classical performances. Until they could gain such experience, virtuosity or speed is something that can be admired or appreciated by anyone. Shankar's celebratory reception by Western audiences later in the 1960s, with reviewers marveling at his demonic virtuosity that virtually toppled the senses, which is up there at the top of his hand, although it's very hard to see, uh, would seem to confirm such widespread assumptions about virtuosity and its obviousness to all involved. But the supposed accessibility of virtuosity, especially across cultural lines, was not universally celebrated. In the wake of the sitar explosion of 1966 and 1967, British organologist Jeremy Montague denied there was any real significance in the entire Western reception of Shankar, declaring, what the untutored Indian thinks of Bach and the untutored Westerner of Ravi Shankar does not really mean anything. This tension between celebrations of virtuosity's widespread appeal and suspicions of it as shallow or even meaningless is hardly unique to Shankar's reception or to intercultural, intercultural encounters more generally. It has long characterized discourses about virtuosity in European art music. And I would argue more broadly that it presents a concrete example of the contrasting approaches of naive empiricism and, and skeptical idealism between which phenomenology attempts to navigate. And yet, as Merleau-Ponty de demonstrates in the introduction to Phenomenology of Perception, the surface differences between these seemingly opposed sides tend to obscure their common assumptions. Whether celebrated for its power or derided as an easy trick, both locate virtuosity in the more or less isolated entities of the performer's body or the music itself. And it is there that it is either easily recognized or unwittingly misinterpreted by the outside perceiver. This paper employs a phenomenological framework to argue that virtuosity is located and lived not in the isolated body of the performer nor the private judgments of the listener, but the intercorporeal social space of experience. Rather than mere speed or spectacle, Virtuosity emerges as a socially constructed phenomenon that centers on skill made apparent and socially meaningful. My paper will proceed in three parts. I'll begin by explicating the role of apperception and embodied intersubjectivity in encountering the skilled body of the performer. And I'll just say as an aside that it's really fun to have apperception and intercorporeality just like words that are floating around before my paper then rather than being like, oh, here's some weird things I brought for you. Um, I, I then turn to the importance of sociality as a thematized element within performance and conclude by considering how intersubjectivity serves as a criterion for reflecting upon the value of a particular performance act. Pursuing these arguments in the context of Shankar's Western reception brings into focus an issue that, haunts virtual, that seems to haunt virtuosity any time it escapes the social confines of the guild of experts and practitioners. How do we interpret people's claims to value that which they don't seem to be capable of understanding or even fully experiencing? Dan Zahavi cautions that we cannot simply insert inter intersubjectivity somewhere within an already established ontology. Instead, the three regions, self, others, and world, belong together. They reciprocally illuminate one another and can only be understood in their interconnection. Thus, approaching virtuosity as a fundamentally intersubjective phenomenon is meant partially to clarify the place of the subject within that same phenomenon. For even as the virtuoso subject differentiates herself from the crowd as a result of her remarkable ability, virtuosity is not simply the accomplishments of a subject, nor is it about subjectivity. Rather, it is an intersubjective performance of subjectivity, agency, and the values that subtend these categories. Because virtuosity is already a saturated phenomenon, so full of gesture and sound, it may be tempting to treat these as the obvious center from which the other more abstract qualities might be interpreted. But virtuosity does not necessarily involve a logical extrapolation that, considering the sonic and aesthetic qualities of the music, it must be a result of the subject's skilled labor. 
Rather, drawing from the vocabulary of phenomenology, we can say that aspects of this skilled act of production and the laboring subject engaged in it are aperceived. Aperception refers to the way that perceptual experience always includes more than that which is directly presented. In Husserl's most straightforward example, it describes the way that we experience multiple profiles of a physical object at once. When I look at a book, I directly perceive only a single side from my particular vantage point, but its other sides are also dimly present within my experience. Beyond knowing there are other sides, those sides are present to me despite their perceptual absence. They are unperceived. In this spatial example, I can directly perceive the other sides by adopting a different vantage point. But our perception does not necessarily depend upon this future reorientation. Instead, Husserl argues that our perception points back to a prior moment in which an object with a similar sense became constituted for the first time. I perceive an object's other sides because I have previously encountered things like this before, though not precisely this thing. Importantly, this is not inference, not a thinking act, but a fundamental part of perceptual experience. In Husserl's more extended argument related to the term, our perception provides the basis for an intersubjective pairing, which Merleau-Ponty adapts as a transfer of corporeal schema that forms the basis of an embodied intersubjectivity. Through our perception, I encounter the other not just as an object taking up space in my world, but as a fellow embodied subject. Because it depends on our ongoing embodied experience in the world, our perception might seem more useful for explaining experiences of virtuosity within shared cultural worlds. But it can also explain how audiences might stand in awe of Shankar's ability, despite their unfamiliarity with the music and its mode of production. It is their own body that serves as the medium through which an audience member grasps the laboring body of Shankar as skilled. In this way, Shankar's assumptions about speed's salience for novice audiences hold true. Speed and precision appear as intelligible markers of skill across many cultural frameworks frameworks precisely because I have my own embodied experience of how challenging actions of this type are. Lest it seem that this affirms Shankar's claim for the universal immediacy of virtuosity, however, our perception also takes seriously how the promotional materials that constantly touted Shankar's ability shaped the experience of novice listeners. As Husserl writes regarding our perception, what is, perceptual, what is there perceptually motivates belief in something else being there too. And in this way, discourse and our perception can become intertwined. This interplay is particularly important for explaining the experience of listeners who encountered Chucker on LP recording, where there was little else but sound to directly perceive. Although their unfamiliarity might make them unlikely to perceive Shankar's skill via sound alone, the rhetoric of liner notes and Shankar's many celebrity advocates directed their attention, supplementing the multiple other sides of the phenomenon to which they did not have direct access. Our perception can further address complaints that novice experiences of virtuosity are based on faulty judgments of skill. In a judgment-based paradigm of virtuosity, a listener's lack of knowledge about the aesthetics of a particular musical tradition and its technical procedures can invalidate the experience. If they do not understand the sounds produced or the actions that produced them, how can their appreciation be legitimate? Yet this presumes that the lived meaning of virtuosity is found precisely in sound or performance, and I would argue a great deal of virtuosity's significance actually lies in the relation between the two. Many audience comments show that what they encountered in Shankar's music was not only the sound or the labor that produced it, but the relationship between Shankar's own laboring body and the product of his labor. If it is that relationship that is primary, then a lack of definition on either side is less of a problem. A listener's experience of a concluding Hala section, for example, likely includes the increasing rhythmic intensity, <coughs> excuse me, the increasing rhythmic intensity of the music and Shankar's quickening movements. But it also potentially includes the apperception of the more or less hidden relationship between Shankar and the music. It is this relationship, apperceived through a person's embodied relation to his or her own actions, that becomes central to how they value the display of skill. And audiences are prone to characterize it in various value-laden terms, like mastery, ease, or hard work. Beyond the implicit role of embodied intersubjectivity in virtuosity, many reviews of Shankar, especially early on, point to musicians' social interactions as key to the construction of virtuosity in, a culture, in an intercultural context. A review for Ravi Shankar's first performance in New York since his 1930s tours with his brother's dance troupe began succinctly. Music is certainly not a universal language. The reviewer, 
identified only as ED, describes feeling like a very obtuse Westerner who could never hope to understand the subtleties of Hindu music. At odds with the seeming sameness of the music, a sort of mournful repetitiousness without apparent rhyme or reason. Things began to change, however, during the second Raga Shekha performed, and Edie wondered about this reason. Perhaps it was the extraordinary virtuosity of Shankar, whose left hand <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> whose left hand flew across the frets with the dexterity to put some of her finest violinists to shame. Or was it the eloquence of the two little drums played by Chaturlal? Faced with unfamiliar music that he found difficult, or he or she found difficult to interpret, Edie first resorted to what psychologist Gustav Jehoda calls anchoring, a process whereby, according to scholar of intercultural communications, Mario Balblasco, foreign or disturbing elements are integrated into our own system of categories. Anchoring can be thought of as a form of the apperceptive transfer of sense that takes place in relation to the unfamiliar. But unlike apperception, which is present in some form in every perception, whether or not it is actively reflected upon, Anchoring is often intentionally adopted as a strategy for coping with the unfamiliar. Edie does this first with a comparison of Shankar to a violinist, but the unfamiliarity of the music eventually led him or her to focus on the socio-musical exchange between Shankar and Chaturla. <clears throat> More than the virtuosity of either artist, it was the communicative understanding between the two and their growing musical excitement that communicated itself irresistibly to the audience. Since its music is half improvised on traditional rhythms and melodic formulas, it is perhaps natural that superb performance should impress itself first on the foreign listener. Absent the necessary background to interpret the sonic results of Shankar's action with the critics' presumed authority, Edie focused on the collaborative social context of improvisation in which they took place. Although Edie does not take the time to explain precisely how he or she observed the relationship between the two musicians, available signs of successful interaction are myriad including sonic indic indications like question and answer phrasing or the shared, perhaps surprising accented beat and visual cues like head gestures, eye contact and general bodily comportment. This focus on social interactions persisted in the later reception as well. Listen to this audience member discuss her experience after a 1967 performance. There was one point in there, I, you know, I can't really tell what he's doing from this distance, but he, but he seemed to be, like, you know, moving with it, and he was just playing with one hand, and the other hand he was, I don't know, really getting in with it. And I don't know, it's sort of like um, watching a god, because, he, you know, and he turns and he smiles at the, at the top list, and it's like, you know, it's just their own little world. They're not, you know, he doesn't care if it went out, he was coughing and, you know, looking at the names of the ragas and looking, you know, intellectual or something, but, I mean, you know, if he started making noise, maybe he'd mind, but it doesn't seem, you know, like an artist who's playing for the audience or who's trying to, you know, evoke a certain emotion or something. It's sort of, it's just that he's doing it for himself and he's sort of giving it the privilege of sitting in on it for 4 dollars <laughs> I know the experts on Hindustani music in the room, uh, we can talk about the ways that she is completely misunderstanding what the relationship between audience and performer is here, but I think we might anticipate a godlike comparison to focus on seemingly superhuman technique or shows of power, the presumed hallmarks of virtuosity. Yet what this listener experienced as godlike, as a godlike display of agency, was Shankar's sheer absorption in his musical labor and the meaningful social connection he enjoyed through it. She admits that she was too far away to even see his actions, yet the perceived relationships between Shankar and his own labor and between the two musicians made it a powerful experience for her. I focus thus far on the role of intersubjectivity and apperception in experiencing virtuosity and on the sociality of performance as a more explicitly, explicitly thematized object of perception. In concluding, I want to consider how intersubjectivity also emerges as a criterion for reflective judgments about virtuosity. A passage from V.A. Howard's Charm and Speed demonstrates this tendency. Considering some examples of non-musical virtuosity, Howard reflects on his experience watching a cheetah chasing a hare on television. I'll read this quote. <coughs> there I cried out at the screen, there is one of nature's great virtuoso performances. But then, is it? I asked myself in the next breath, Acceptable as a metaphoric description of the cheetah's behavior, what is missing here that disqualifies her behavior from literally being a virtuoso or virtuosa performance? Indeed, from being a performance of any kind. Reflection, I thought. She lacks a discerning audience of peers as well as reflective self-criticism. 
Nor again, literally, could she be said to express anything meaningful in or about her behavior, for that requires a symbolic medium to occur. And again, I know Jeff Todd Titan could discuss this idea as well, but I'll leave that to you. I was interested in seeing it, though. Thank you. Yeah. So it seems that Howard's initial experience of the television program is one of virtuosity, but he rejects this characterization on subsequent reflection. This is partially because he conceives of virtuosity as an after-the-fact judgment of experts. It is, quote, a seal of approval bestowed by a critical community. And this characterization situates virtuosity not just within a community of cultural insiders, but in the legitimizing context of the informal guild. Primarily, though, Howard rejects this experience as one of virtuosity because of the cheetah's presumed lack of reflection and language. This again connects to my earlier argument regarding the opperceived relationship between performance, performer and performance, for there is nothing about the act itself that disqualifies it. Instead, it is the animal's opperceived relation to her act that is deemed insufficient. Without language and reflection, which stand as key traits of subjectivity and agency for Howard, he finds himself unable to affirm the degree of intercorporeal intersubjectivity he initially felt. This simple example of everyday media consumption thereby inadvertently demonstrates the stakes of virtuosity. If the phenomenological approach to virtuosity as skill made conspicuous and socially meaningful initially provokes straightforward questions about what counts as skill and how it comes to matter in a particular context, these form the background of much more serious questions. Who counts as a subject? What counts as legitimate labor? If the performer is somehow disqualified, whether classified as an animal body without interiority or a mechanical automaton lacking vitality altogether, the effective, effective and valuable force of the phenomenon dissipates. And yet, Positive assessments of intersubjectivity must not be too complete either. For the display of skill to be meaningful, a listener must find a degree of both commonality and otherness. And this is what I refer to as the likeness difference dynamic of virtuosity. As scholar of performance studies, Judith Hamera argues, the virtuosic body, quote, rewrites plots of possibility for other bodies, even while demonstrating the inability of other bodies, including those of critics, to execute this virtuous discipline themselves. Such plots of possibility are based on a presumed intercorporeal likeness, while the inability of other bodies remains proof of the unabsorbed difference. This dynamic helps explain why Shankar's audiences in Europe and North America did not always consider their lack of knowledge about Hindustani music to be a problem. Asked if they understood the music at that same 1967 performance that I played a clip for you earlier, some concert goers rejected the terms of the question outright, saying, quote, I didn't try to understand it. I just went with it. It was beautiful. Thus, those places where understanding and intersubjectivity break down and the other emerges as radically, perhaps irretrievably other, a philosophical problem for many phenomenologists, constitute a positive feature of virtuosity in many accounts. This recalls the meta-ethical philosophy of Emmanuel Levinas, who explicitly rejected the characterization of an encounter with the other as a fusion. Instead, as Levinas puts it, the relationship with the other is the absence of the other. Obviously, Audiences do not usually speak in such abstract terms, but their comments reflect this balance between likeness and difference by positing Schenker's otherness while specifically pointing to his humanity. Asked by the interview, interviewer if Schenker represented more than music, one concert goer declared, quote, it's not possible to produce music like that without being another kind of human being. Another described him simply as, quote, an unbelievable human being. I've only scratched the surface of the particulars of Schenker's reception, but placing intersubjectivity at the center of my account begins to resolve the problem of the novice by demonstrating how the phenomenon becomes intelligible but despite the imperfect fit between cultural knowledge and musical practice. For many, the value of virtuosity lies precisely in the encounter with a laboring subject who provides both a site for empathy and an otherness that transcends their experience. Thank you.